So hello and uh, welcome to today's webinar, um, ILM tool integration with Argus and Symfony. Welcome everybody uh, to our today's webinar, uh, where we will guide you through uh, the basics of uh, Argus and Symfony combined with a, a live demonstration of a tool integration here. Uh, my name is uh, Alf Klimke, I'm responsible for sales and marketing at ArgoSense and next to me I have Christian Middle who is responsible for product development and he will guide you through the live demo later later on in this webinar. I think we'll, it will take about 30 to 40 minutes also depending a little bit on, on your questions so um, I believe we do not need a complete hour for today's webinar. Um, let me just go to, to the agenda. Um, for today, we have prepared a few words about ArgoSense, about our company and customers, and then we will go directly into uh, an explanation about ArgoSense Symphony, how it works, um, the architecture and other solutions we have, um, followed by the live demo, as I mentioned, from, from Christian. And after that, um, we will have the chance to answer all your questions. A few words about uh, ArgoSense. Uh, we have founded a company in 2009 and uh, spe with a specialization on tool integration and data exchange, which is still today uh, the main focus of our company. Um, anyway, we introduced in 2000, 2013 a solution for traceability and requirements management as we did not want to have a single product strategy here in the company. And um, additionally, that's also uh, used um, very often as a kind of an extension to Argus and Symphony, uh, which helps us collecting all the data. And with this solution for traceability, we can also display this data within a single interface. Of course, uh, we and uh, especially our our employees, they have a strong expertise with all the leading uh, ALM tools in the market. It's not only important that we know uh, everything about our own product, but also um, as this is our core business, uh, we need a lot of specialized knowledge about the ALM tools we are integrating um, as well. And this, I think, is a very beneficial competitive advantage we have also within our company. Um, the software is designed and completely uh, developed here in Germany. All our operations are started here from Germany. So sales, support, uh, marketing, uh, product development, everything is here located um, in Kornwestheim, a small city next to uh, the doors of uh, Stuttgart, so in southern Germany. And um, what is very important um, for us is that our product development um, is more or less aligned with uh, with the uh, requirements we get from from our market and our customers especially so usually I think 90 percent of the new development is is really based on the feedback we get from our customers uh, so you can expect a product which is really driven by us as our customers here um, our customers here are a few few of our main customers um, and if there is any need for anybody of you maybe getting a, a, a contact directly within within one uh, of our customers to get a first hand uh, information about us and our products uh, directly from a user um, just get in touch with us and we can we can arrange a contact here um, a lot of our customers are willing to talk with other prospects uh, before they are buying Argosense software now let's go to the Argosin solutions. As I said, um, we have two products. The main product, uh, Argosin Symphony, which we will talk about today, um, covers two aspects. One is ALM tool integration, and uh, as well as automated B2B data exchange. So when we have an asynchronous um, synchronization with other parties, for example. And we have Argosin Fidelia as um, traceability and requirements management products, um, which is quite new in the market, um, but we think it's a very, very good alternative to all the old-fashioned uh, requirements management tools, which are 
already in, in place and uh, offers a lot of very modern functionality and uh, architecture behind it. So um, this is, uh, the, as I said, the, the data exchange um, option of, of Argos and Symfony. You just a small overview about that. So here, uh, the product is very often used in the automotive industry where um, suppliers and uh, car manufacturers communicate, um, for example, with regards to um, with regards to uh, issues or bugs or open points list. Um, so with uh, Symphony here, we can establish a complete round trip, uh, completely automated between these ex external partners. Usually the, the um, car manufacturers, they have kind of a customer portal um, where they um, offer, um, for example, XML files to be downloaded by the supplier and imported in his own issue tracking tool. And we can, as I said, completely um, organize this downloading, importing, exporting, and uploading um, effort um, so that for the supplier, for example, there is really no extra effort for their, um, for their developers anymore. And they work just in their tracking tool as they are used to work with it internally. Um, for most of these typical um, customer portals from, for example, Daimler, BMW, Volkswagen, Porsche, and so on. We have kind of uh, synchronization templates uh, developed, which are more or less a collection of all the, um, the requirements and uh, the experience we have made in the past, so that it's, uh, in the meantime, very easy to, to, to start a project from scratch. So it's just a number of, I would say, one or two days in the meantime to connect your system with the with your customer system and uh, get a product and the project running here. <clears throat> so the main focus for today, as I said, tool integration. So here, Argus and Symphony is uh, used in a slightly different way. So here we can uh, make use uh, of a direct connection to the different tools. Um, which you have in place internally. So behind these domains uh, on, on that picture, like requirements management, defect management, and so on and so on, we have the different tools like IBM doors or Polarion or however they, they are called. And our system is um, connecting them through their specific APIs and uh, gives you, so with that functionality, the ability to really combine all these different tools and silos uh, into one homogeneous tool chain, so to say. So that means you can really reach traceability across all your disciplines um, using, using Argus and Symfony. Um, also here we are working with so-called synchronization templates. So all the typical use cases between for integrating the different tools or domains. So we have um, put into, into templates so that we have a very uh, quick setup uh, time here for that. But anyway, it's always possible to, to customize these templates uh, according to your specific uh, and individual needs here, of course. So this means for all of our customers and potential customers, which have a kind of a best of breed um, um, architecture within their tool chain, there it is uh, well, well supported by, by Argos and Symfony. If you need um, information about all the different tools we are currently supporting, um, I would like to just refer you to, to our website. So there's a, there's a menu item called integrations and here you can see all the latest uh, um, adapters uh, we we have support for uh, the different tools here's a small a small example uh, for one of our customers um, just to show you a little bit uh, potential complexity so usually we do not have a one-to-one -one integration between the different tools it's more that, that you can see here that we have um, many to many um, integrations, which you can imagine would be very difficult to achieve if you are just using some kind of plugin. So maybe for Jira, you know, there are a lot of plugins on, on the way. You would have to install um, a lot of plugins. You would have, 
we would need maybe to have some individual scripts and whatever. So, but with Argos and Symphony, you can connect all these tools uh, in, man, in a many to many direction, um, having the same technology for integration uh, for all kinds of uh, connections here. And I think that makes it very uh, beneficial for our customers uh, on the one hand. And on the other hand, of course, um, if you need to um, update one of the tools in your uh, in, in your network here, um, you just need to, to update uh, maybe to a new adapter version and then you can, uh, in the background, you can simply update your tool so you have no dependency anymore on, on other tool vendors versions. Um, so this is completely covered now then by, by Argus and Symfony. So looking here from a, um, from a more higher perspective um, on, on that architecture, um, you can see that um, we have, um, for each of the tools we, we support, we have a specific adapter. These are the, the blue boxes here. And with these adapters, they have mainly the task of, um, as I said, connecting to the tool's API. So we have connection parameters which can be introduced and configured. They understand the syntax and um, the adapters also understand the data format which um, is necessary for, for the tool. And we are over these uh, adapters kind of normalizing this information into our platform and have then the ability to collect all the data and send all the data uh, based on kind of a bus system here internally. What you see here in the middle is this, um, is this um, process template. So it's not only just one, uh, let's say process configuration. So we can have as many processes and uh, um, differently configured processes, if you like, um, within the platform. So for example, maybe you have two similar tools in different departments, but they have a complete different uh, use case for their integration. So this is just a matter of either process uh, template configuration or maybe different process templates. Um, in general here. Um, then for from the administrative perspective, we have different modules um, within Argos and Symphony, which are accessed by the administrators via web interface. So uh, for example, um, we can here configure, um, let's say the adapter. So if for in our example with CodeBeamer, maybe you have different CodeBeamer instances, you can have different configurations for, for your endpoints. Um, you can create different mapping scenarios. Uh, you can also have different schedules. So that means if you have different processes running and in different intervals, this is something you can control here in this interface. So this is, and you will see that in, uh, in a few minutes in Christian's demonstration, it's very easy to configure uh, for you. And there's not much training necessary um, just for, for configuration of the system. Um, we have really simplified a product in a way that it's uh, now really a, a matter of hours to get familiar with, with the system and make your own configurations. Okay, so this is it so far from, from my side. So I will talk later about some specific features which may be not covered by Christian's demo. So now I will switch over to uh, Christian's PC just a second. So then you will see, you should see the start screen okay now you see the login screen hopefully and i will hand over to christian now it's your turn thank you ralph um so i have for today i have been bringing up um, a code beamer instance i will just log into that and i have just created a, a small sample project a tracker i'm using the box tracker today but i'm going to show all aspects of the configuration. Uh, created two tickets so that we will also see something moving later on. Um, I have a Jira system running. It's a Jira server, did the same thing. There's a basic uh, project in place. And uh, of course I have a Symfony system running. That's the new 3.2 version. So I will also log into that. Um, 
And what I have prepared as well for today is I did some basic component installations. That is what you have just seen in Ralph's presentation. Like in the list, we have two adapters installed, one for CodeBeamer, one for Jira. Um, as well, I have installed the uh, basic process template. This is kind of a collection of the best practices that we have developed over the past 10 years. And on top of these, um, these best practices, there is the integration between CodePima and Jira installed. That's the standard um, process as we also ship it. Um, and as Ralph indicated, um, these, the standard process very, very often is exactly what is required for the projects. However, we are still in a position to adjust it to more specific needs. Um, in order to get the system up and running, um, what we need to do is we need to take additional configurations. So the first step, I have already prepared that as well, is if I jump into the CodeBeam adapter, we can see the list of what we call configuration sets. And these configuration sets, they are basically connections to, to actual server instances. So I have created a config set called local CodeBeamer. And if I check the details, we can see it's going to it's going to connect me with my local code be my instance. Um, of course, what you can do is uh, for for any kind of more complex environment, for example, if you have three, four, five different instances of code be more, each will be referenced by an individual config set. In that sense, these config sets are also what we call aliases for for server connections. I did the same thing for Jira, um, so I've connected um, connected the adapter um, with my local Jira instance. And um, finally, what I need to do, this is what I what I still wanted to show to you, is the configuration of the process itself. So in terms of a configuration set, like in the context of a process, this is not so much a connection to a server, of course. This is usually more a project configuration. So the idea is that you have a, a process in place that is connecting CodeBeamer and Jira. And by setting up a couple of different configuration sets, you can have individual configurations per project that you are synchronizing. So I will just uh, create one for a project called Argo. This is the shortcut of the, I just called it Argo in CodePim and I also call it Argo in Jira. Um, so we call it Argo here. And um, part of the configuration work is then what I have here is I have to tell the sync which Jira instance we are using. I have to tell the sync which CodePeam instance we are using. So you can see you're quite flexible in connecting different server instances. Um, depending on the on the Jira configuration itself, it's going to show up the list of issue types. So I have to let the process know in case a new item has to be created in Jira, which issue type. Um, should be used. I also have to tell the process in case of a creation of a new item which project has to be used. And on at the same time, I have to also tell the system with tracker in CodeBeamer is used. Um, as I have already shown here, I was like getting up the box. So I select the box here. The other two aspects um, are then uh, for the transformation of the data, like um, on this in, like later on the synchronization, if we transport an object from CodePeamer to Jira, we have to translate the attribute names. And uh, this brings us to Symfony's mapping module. Um, the process template itself um, is built on a behavior that we call uh, merge syncing. Um, so we would uh, we would simply configure two mapping scenarios. One that describes what how data is transported from CodePeamer to uh, Jira, and one for the other way around. And the merge synker is basically syncing um, syncing up to the point where it detects a conflict. That's pretty neat, especially if you um, 
if you have a relatively high frequency of the syncing. So I will just jump into that. Um, so and I'll make sure we have a mapping then available that is code Beamer to Jira. What I need to tell Symfony is which actual connections I'm using. So from local code Beamer, I'm transporting bugs into Jira over all so that we know the details of the underlying data model. And then I can just simply um, simply see, so this is the list of the attributes that, that are coming from CodeBeamer. So we would map the name into, I would think the summary is appropriate. Um, and we could also um, add more stuff here. Um, the other thing that you can do in the mapping is if it comes to like, for example, stuff like priority, let's say priority goes into, into a priority. Um, I can also work with these enumeration fields. And then uh, very often we have underlying what we call a value mapping. And in these value mappings, we are describing the translation of the values. And very often the priorities are called differently, even if they mean the same thing. So we could, for example, then select and say this goes into high, low, and so on. Um, so I keep it as simple as possible today. Uh, this can be extended uh, at any time. And so I will just create one in the other direction. So we would say from these are the GRR to code FEMA mappings. Um, just, no, I think I can just put it here. So this is GRR to code FEMA. I do the same thing that was GRR to code FEMA. Box again. And then I can just say, well, from the source side, we want to take the description and bring it back into the description. Cool. This is uh, the remaining aspect. So we have a, a, a mapping for code beam of the Jira and a mapping for Jira to code beam. And as I said, these objects can be easily reused. There's also a mechanism of inheritance in the mapping. So if I just jump back into one of the scenarios, you can see I can also select the basic um, a basic mapping. This is pretty much if you have a high volume, if you have uh, a real large amount of projects to be synchronized, like we have seen some customers going up to, I don't know, 1,200 projects. So you usually would put all the standard fields and all the common fields um, of those projects into a basic mapping, reuse it, and then only do a project-specific configuration individually if needed. Good. So I think we are pretty much settled. Um, the final thing is the scheduling module. In the scheduling module, what I need to do is I need to set up a schedule. So we want to Jira schedule. Um, we are using uh, the cron mechanism itself. There's a little editor built in here, which is going to help with uh, the syntax. So you can basically configure any kind of scheduling, so proven technology. Um, I just store it. I select uh, which of the processes we want to use. Here I can then bring in the project configuration, store it, and that's pretty much it. So usually now the system would trigger um, everything. I can also still run it myself. And that brings us into the diagnose window and in the diagnose, we are going to usually see stuff. I'll just check. Oh, that was too fast. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, like with the last release of Symphony, we have been speeding up things so much that uh, that even the diagnose is not. Ah, now we have some updates at least. Um, so yeah, two objects transported. Um, let's have a look into into uh, Jira. So both tickets there. And I guess I can just like, I can try that as well. So we send a hello from Jira and I'll just run it. 
And now let's see on the code demo side. I, I just have to check what I, I changed the ticket number two. Yes, so we'll take a look here. So, and that's pretty much um, everything you have to you have to set up. Um, the schedules and the mappings they are also grouped uh, in a first line. So you have kind of like folders. So anything that belongs together, specific integrations, you will put under the same scenario type. Same for the schedules, you would put in the same schedule groups. Um, other than that, um, I would just mention um, with the latest version, there's also REST interfaces available uh, for each of the adapters. So you can talk to all the adapters in the adapter interfaces through a REST interface. That's pretty helpful in some cases in which um, in which you are also developing your own processes. You could also access the data through that interfaces. That's um, that's new um, in that version. And um, yeah, that's pretty much everything I wanted to show this afternoon. So I'm handing back to Ralph. Okay, thanks, Kristen. Um, Yes, so as I said, that was a very uh, quick overview um, how Symfony is, uh, is is set up and and how easy it is um, to to get a first project uh, up and running. So it's basically really not more you have to do. Uh, of course, you have to do a little bit more configuration in terms of maybe a little bit more mappings and attribute mappings and stuff like that. But from um, from the basis, it's simply that what you what you have to do. Um, using our process templates, um, it's it's very easy. Of course, there's a little bit more complexity if you have a lot of dependencies and rules uh, which apply to your uh, config, uh, uh, synchronization processes. Um, then um, um, we would we would um, adjust these process templates. But as Christian said, out of our 10 years experience now, I think we have extracted the most um, the most important and most used uh, uh, workflows uh, into these templates so that I would say it should should work for 80% of our customers. So we believe that's a typical 2080 rule here also for, for our process models. So I'm just jumping back to my presentation. Um, yeah, I got a few Few more slides for you. Hopefully, now we got it. Um, there are some some uh, things which are more or less under the hood of, of Symphony, which I would like to uh, go through in in, in in a few in a few minutes. So one aspect is also uh, clustering and load balancing. So for for customers, um, and we have a lot of them which use Symphony in a in a very large environment with a lot of um, tools, maybe with a lot of users in the background. Um, um, Symphony gets more and more critical, so that it's really should be should have a 99.9999 percent uh, uptime here, and we can achieve that with just uh, clustering uh, symphony so our customers they just need to install um, a second and a third or whatever a number of new symphony servers and they will uh, we are a simple configuration and be connected with each other and uh, from that time on symphony automatically takes over all the management of one is um, the availability so if one server maybe goes down for whatever reason the other servers will take the load from that server and at the same time the load will be balanced through these different cluster nodes um, also automatically by symphony so this is uh, yeah very very important for our for our larger customers here um, another aspect is uh, the transactional data synchronization so what we can achieve here is that for example if we could not synchronize object for, objects for certain reasons. Um, a customer can decide what, what happens. So it can decide even if uh, that op failed objects will be skipped and locked uh, for later re um, resolving the issues or the complete process should be stopped. So whatever um, kind of preference our customers have can be, can be configured. Or for example, if an endpoint is not accessible, maybe due, main, due to maintenance or whatever, um, 
the process will not simply crash, so it will try to uh, to um, to restart um, automatically. So here you can see the interface for for the different options you have. So for example, for retrying. Um, retrying, uh, getting access and connection back to the endpoint. Uh, this is configurable. So all in all, it's uh, just a help for the administrators so that they have to, um, let's say, watch the system as less as possible. And it it's has kind some kind of, so to say, self-healing uh, mechanisms within that. So anyway, if it's uh, still not successful, of course, we can then shoot emails to certain persons or email addresses so that they can have a look at the system and resolve issues. Um, we are also offering an adaptive framework. So that's, that's our development environment to develop new adapters. Um, and what we are doing at the same time is offering this adaptive framework to our customers so that they can uh, develop customers on their own. So we have a large number of customers which have tools which they built on their own or which are not that, uh, let's say, familiar on the market. Um, but still, they want to um, fetch and create data um, from and in, in these tools so they can build their own adapters and then have the possibility uh, to really um, integrate all the tools based on a common technology with Argos and Symfony. So this is very, very beneficial here. Um, additional features uh, is, for example, that we are uh, sensitive to contextual information, uh, like, for example, attachments or hierarchies of structures. So if you, for example, we have uh, synchronized data from, from a requirements managed tool like uh, Fidelia or DAWs, um, maybe into another into a test management system like uh, HP Quality Center, we can preserve the hierarchy and the structure of the information, even if it's, it's even if it's changing in the meantime. We can uh, we um, we will consider that we will consider the um, synchronization of attachments, of course. Uh, this is very important. Also, we have some special functionality for comment comment fields. Um, we have, um, this is also for large organizations, uh, multi-tenancy capabilities. So you can really split the system into different uh, slices so that you can reuse the adapters and you can reuse the, the processes which, which are installed into the platform. But uh, different departments, for example, they can completely configure these, these processes and adapters uh, completely according to their uh, specific needs in their uh, departments or projects, however you want to you wanna split that. So you can um, enable kind of a sub administration on, on the system. Further features are, of course, uh, not only one synchronization process can be run at the same time, it can be run in, in parallel. Uh, we have different um, options how to start these um, synchronization processes. So what Christian showed is was the manual um, manual triggering, which is usually uh, used for, for testing purposes. There you do not want to wait until uh, maybe the, the schedule is now uh, triggering, triggering the, the the start of a process, but you can also have um, the start of a process triggered by one of the tools you are integrating, for example, with kind of event triggers, uh, server side event triggers, or maybe with user defined buttons or whatever you want. So there's uh, there are a lot of lot of options here. And um, last but not least, um, which a thing which is very important, uh, completely invisible in the background, is our persistence module, which gives you uh, the ability of linking data very intelligently. So what we are doing is, in, in the background, we record uh, always the combination of the um, of the data. Um, so the item ID you have seen here in, in Jira and the item ID of uh, the issues in CodeBeamer, they need, of course, to be stored, um, that they are related with each other. And we are doing that not with extending the data, um, the data in uh, um, the data layout in the tools. We are storing that information within our persistence module on the one hand side. And we are also storing um, information um, in terms of the content of the of, of the items, but not the content directly, just 
checksums of it and so we have the ability to see if there are any if any changes have been made to the items between two synchronization runs and then we will just synchronize this data which really only has been changed and leave uh, the unchanged data completely untouched which reduces uh, definitely um, network um, network uh, uh, consumption and speeds up the synchronization processes significantly. Then as Christian um, explained with this basic process there are also means for automatic conflict handling uh, or for um, information uh, to administrators if conflicts are uh, rising so there are also different possibilities for configuration here. Um, yeah so I think that's uh, pretty much a complete overview. Um, I think we have reached our time targets here. So 40 minutes, very good. So now I think we can we can jump into the Q and A session here. Um, let's see if already some questions have come up. So I'll open my questioner panel. Okay, there's at least one. The first one is. Uh, Okay, so is it possible to synchronize uh, Sparks Enterprise Architect and CodeBeamer? E.g., if I create a new artifact requirement in EA, then there will be a new requirement tracker item in CodeBeamer and vice versa. That's the question. Maybe I hand over that to Christian. Yes, there is also a standard process in place for Spark CA and CodeBeaver that does exactly uh, what you're asking for. Yeah. So it's really depending on how you are working with the tools. I would say um, many, uh, many of our customers, they start first with the requirements management side of it and then um, put, synchronize the requirements into the modeling tool. From there, they, they create they create their their uh, use cases and models and synchronize that information back into the requirements tool. But of course, you can also start from the other side. Um, it's depending on on how how your people are working with it. Okay, so uh, one question which is uh, coming up very often is how, uh, what kind of, of, of uh, trainings uh, are you offering? So basically we are just offering one, one training um, session that is how to, um, how to customize uh, the system and um, create own adapters. So it's a, sometimes we split it into two trainings, uh, sometimes it's combined training. Um, that's all you need is uh, is Java knowledge, um, Java 8 knowledge, and then um, it's about two days training. Um, then you should be in a position really to to completely um, um, customize these uh, synchronization templates or create new ones from scratch. Uh, so other questions. Um, uh, um, if the different instances of CodeBeamer are synchronized, or if different instances of CodeBeamer are synchronized using Argosense and the project projects are set up using exactly the same project template in CodeBeamer, is there any faster way of mapping fields? Yes, I think that's exactly what Christian uh, tried to show with the basic mapping. Probably, or maybe Christian, do you have another answer to that? I mean, I it's it's in in general, um, in general, all the adapters. What they do is that they're gonna that they're gonna make um, translations between the values and the internal IDs. So regardless of of what instance you speak to, if you're using the same template, it has the same names. Um, so what you could do if you want to transport items simply between the the instances and have no further rules, you can just also write them through. So just don't map anything and just use all, all the data you can grab. Yeah, and as I said, on the other hand, you can you can reuse the mappings. So it's you do not have to uh, 
to to create to create new mapping scenarios for each project you can just write one or define one not write one and use it uh, for any other project so that's the basic concept of symphony that every configuration you're doing you can reuse it um, in another context <clears throat> so another question uh, is still writing um, enterprise architect code beamer again if i start with a system engineering approach in ea and later want to import a model into code beamer is there any information lost like dependencies between elements and so on uh, the question here is like in the standard template you would uh, simply synchronize the requirements objects um, if it comes uh, if it comes to the traceability you will have to make a decision how how uh, how you want to treat the additional objects um, from enterprise architect so the standard template is implemented in such a way that it assumes uh, you are mainly maintaining your requirements in code people they are getting transported into a certain package in enterprise architect then you're going to make the, the traces there However, if you want to transport um, more of the model back into code be more, um, this would be a customization then to the standard template. Um, the EA adapter itself as the code be adapter, by the way, would support functionality to um, to rebuild links in either of the systems. But that's just that's just then a behavior which is a little bit more specific to your use case. Okay, so I think that was it so far. So if anybody's still writing, maybe I'm in the meantime, I'll just uh, give you uh, just a hint how you can how you can reach us. So here's our contact data. As I said, if you like to see a list of uh, currently supported tools, just go go on our website under the product section, product menu. There's the integrations page. Uh, anyway, for this webinar, which we have recorded, um, all the participants uh, will receive an email um, with a download link um, for uh, for the presentation and also a link to uh, to the complete um, um, record recording of that to the video of that uh, webinar. Just see, has somebody raised hands? Oh no, that's nothing specific. Okay, so yeah, if there are no other questions i would like uh, to thank you all also in the name of christian for participating uh, to that um, meeting um, i would like um, to invite you to one of the next meetings we have one uh, for argus and svidelia next week if you are interested in requirements management and traceability and i would be very looking forward if you have any more questions just contact us either through the email address given here our phone number or if you already have a set contact to one of our salespersons just go over that way so thanks again and uh, enjoy the rest of your day bye bye